Um, right now, I would like to transition us to our first speaker, Dr. Joyce Dorado, who's joining us from UCSF. So Dr. Joyce Dorado is director and co-founder of UCSF Hearts and a clinical professor in the Department of um, Psychiatry at UCSF Zuckerberg San Francisco General Hospital. She's an appointed member of the California State Supreme Court Justices Statewide Steering Committee for the Keeping Kids in School and Out of Courts Initiative, as well as the lead curriculum developer and a master trainer for the San Francisco Department of Public Health's Trauma-Informed Systems Initiative. She has worked with trauma-impacted children, youth, and families for 27 years, has presented at numerous regional, national, and international conferences and events, and is a published author. So with that, I'd like to invite Dr. Dorado to the front. Thank you. Here's the clicker. This is the big one. Yeah. Okay, got it. Hi, everybody. Just get situated here. Hi, everyone. Thank you very much um, for inviting me to talk about this crucial topic that is near and dear to my heart. It's, uh, I'm aware that there's a real range of people, professions, and sectors in the room, and we need that, right, because working collectively together is really what it's going to take to move the needle for all uh, children and youth who've experienced trauma. So I see my work as providing a trauma-informed and healing center lens to your expertise and the expertise of other ex uh, educators and other professionals uh, as they do their work so that we can do our best for the people that we serve while also staying well and healthy in the process. I, um, here's my clicker, let's do this. So, mm, interesting uh, formatting issues. Um, so I found, founded an organization called UCSF Healthy Environments in Response to Trauma in Schools. We're a whole school systems change approach to addressing trauma in schools. And um, we have been working for 10 years with San Francisco Unified School District, Oakland Unified, and other school districts to try to create more safe, supportive, and equitable school cultures and climates where everyone in the school community can thrive, adults and students alike. And I'll tell you a little bit more about our program at the end of this, but first, I'd like to offer a framework. Uh, this is a, um, a framework for creating safe, supportive, equitable, and healing organizations that we believe can be helpful across multiple sectors. And these are our core guiding principles um, that we use um, to, to organize our trainings, our consultations, our school supports. They're all, if you look at them, they're all related, but we do believe that each of them are vital to any trauma-informed approach. And uh, they're grounded in science uh, and in, uh, around interventions for complex trauma, organizational change theory, and they're drawn from trauma-informed systems work across the country, including that of SAMHSA. So some of this may feel familiar to some of you. Many of these principles are values that are shared by a variety of programs, including standard educational best practices. But what we know is that chronic stress and trauma can sometimes get in the way of being able to consistently abide by these principles. So we actually need to take stress and trauma into account and then make active effort efforts to counteract the effects of stress and trauma, and we'll talk a little bit about what that means too, to forward each of these. So um, I just want to say that these principles were co-created with the San Francisco Department of Public Health Trauma-Informed Systems Initiative. Uh, they're being used across many sectors in San Francisco, in, including education, child welfare, juvenile justice, public health. And they're also actually being um, sort of spread across seven counties in the Bay Area uh, with child and youth family, uh, child, youth, and family serving sectors. So um, they've really taken hold where, where we live. Uh, there's a, uh, a uh, we have a trauma-informed systems regional center called Trauma Transform that is uh, lives in EBAC. So these principles, I, I want to say, are are meant to apply not only to students and our work with them, but also to staff and caregivers, to leadership, and to the school system as a whole. Um, so what, much of what we do actually is workforce development and systems change. So for example, for the compassion and dependability principle at the bottom, we believe that everyone in the school community, students and adults alike, need to experience compassionate and dependable relationships to be successful. 
um, and that trauma-informed leadership, for example, is relational at its core, and that school policies and procedures should create conditions that foster caring and trustworthy relationships, as opposed to inadvertently getting, getting in the way of those. Yeah? So the first principle we're going to talk about is understanding trauma and stress. Um, so Sandra Bloom tells us that learning about the psychobiology of stress, toxic stress, and trauma is liberating for us. It can give us some explanation for some of those otherwise really puzzling behaviors that can happen in front of us or there are those big feelings that can come to dominate us. And the fact is, as um, folks were saying earlier, 89% of us are going to experience some sort of trauma by the time we grow old. That's most of us. So it's really not about those traumatized people over there and then us over here who are going to heal them. Like We are all, we all are in this together and we all have a stake in doing what needs to happen to, to heal. Um, so... Um, I'm going to say a little bit just to get us on the same page about how we define trauma. This is a, a compilation of many experts. Um, trauma is a combination of an event, how we experience that event, and how it affects us, right? So the event is a danger or um, a serious threat of harm, and we are hardwired when we experience that sort of threat to <gasps> go into fight, flight, or freeze, right? And um, what makes trauma traumatic is that despite what we do, we're helpless to escape that overwhelming stressor which then overwhelms our brain and body's ability to cope, which then causes a, dis, a disintegration of the parts of brain and body that normally work well together, which leads to dysregulation. So dysregulation is a very important term. This is the loss of capacity to modulate our internal states, our bodily states, our emotional states, our stress arousal states, and ultimately our behavior. And then over time, this can have lasting adverse effects. So that's the bad news. But the fact is we do not take a deficit approach to trauma. We believe that when people have experienced chronic trauma, that, that they make behavioral adaptations to survive. Right? And then the problem becomes when we take those adaptations out of the context of trauma and plop them in a classroom. Right? And then um, folks who have been doing stuff that, they, that worked for them outside of the classroom to survive get labeled, mislabeled, right? as crazy, as defiant and willful, as rude, maybe even as criminal. Right? So we're trying to turn this around. And part of what can help us turn this around is a shift in perspective. Understanding trauma can help us make a crucial shift in our perspectives. So in schools, for example, what we often see is a student who is off task, right? Um, maybe he's being um, a little bit mouthy with the teacher. Maybe he's in be even being a little bit aggressive and running out of the classroom. And or we might see school staff who are having really big, intense reactions, sometimes disproportionate to the behavior in front of them, um, or who are having trouble doing their work well, or maybe who are having really intense interactions, negative interactions with their colleagues, right? When we are not in our best selves, what we tend to do is we look at these folks and we think, what is wrong with you? What's wrong with you? And that tends to lead to a certain sort of negative feeling, right? Which then can lead to a fairly negative um, uh, reaction, often punitive, right? Um, and um, what we, what we want to say is that we need to shift our perspective with this lens from uh, one that asks what is wrong with you to what has happened to you. When we ask what has happened to you, even if what we're wondering, we're just wondering and making a guess that something is, there's more to this picture, right, than, than I'm seeing in front of me. What that does, it actually helps uh, provide a context for the behavior, not an excuse, but some sort of explanation of like what just happened, right? That can help um, create a sense of connection and compassion, which is better for the person in front of us as well as for us, um, which then also helps us to see the strengths that people are bringing to bear, despite what they're up against. And all of that can help us be much more effective in our response. Um, when we do that, apply this to students, for example, we, it moves us away from punishing them for being in, for being in survival mode. Um, and, and, and further, when we apply this shift to our teachers and school staff, the adults in the school, this actually helps us to see how working with trauma-impacted students day in and day out can have an effect on the adults, right? Their health, behavior, uh, relationships, job performance. It moves us away from teacher blaming that's been happening recently, finger pointing, and moves us towards supporting our educators to be able to be their best professionally by attending to their wellness, mitigating the effects of uh, burnout, vicarious trauma, um, and keeping our educators healthy and in the profession so we don't lose people to burnout. So this is true not only for educators, but in any organization, right? We have to take care of our workers.
So just to make the connections, we, we've talked about um, trauma. There's other language about this, including ACEs. All this is are very similar um, parts of the field. And um, now I'm just going to move to a little bit, a tiny bit about neurobiology. So knowing what ha happens under the hood actually helps me and other people, teachers and such, not take behavior that's coming at them personally. Right? Um, I just, oh, that's the brain taking over. So um, the other thing to know, because there's many medical professionals in this room, what we've done is we've taken a really complex bunch of information and boiled it down to the protoplasm, the, just the tiny protoplasm of what anyone needs to know to be able to shift their practices um, when they're working with trauma impacted in any, any person, okay? So um, first thing I just want to um, bring to the front is um, Hebb's rule. So that's neurons that fire together, wire together, right? And what we know is there's a gazillion neural networks in our bodies, right? And here's some, some neurons together. And every time I do say, think, feel something, neurons fire together in a network. And um, every time they fire together, they wire together a little bit more strongly. So if I do something over and over and over again, it, it makes these connections much more strong and eventually automatic. It's why practice makes perfect. And it's why difficult habits, I mean, unhealthy habits are so hard to break, right? Because we got to wear uh, sort of new, uh, do, um, create new uh, connections in our neural pathways. Um, so that's all good and fine. It's how we learn. But what happens if what's, ha what's firing over and over and over in my brain is <gasps> fight, flight, or freeze, right? <gasps> fight, flight, or freeze because I'm under chronic threat. Well, that then is the, um, as the, are the neural networks that get wired up really strongly. And so put super simplistically, trauma wears a groove in the brain that we more easily fall into. And so this is a metaphor that is a 20th century metaphor, but I think most of you in the room probably recognize this is a vinyl record, right? And back in the olden days, for those of you young people in the room, um, we used to put this, so there's a needle that you put on the record, and those little bands there are songs. And if you play a song a gazillion times, what happens over time is that it actually wears a groove in the record, right? And I could be playing a different song on the record, and then somebody actually bumps the turntable, and then the needle goes, and it lands in that deep groove, right? And then maybe the groove is so deep that it gets to the end of the song, and instead of moving to the next song, it just sort of skips right back into the song, right? So that's all good and fine if it's your favorite song. But what if it's the fear song? What if it's the trauma groove? Because that's the groove that I've got, right? And then what can happen is, and this is how trauma works and why it's so confusing for a lot of people. Um, I'm, I have a trauma history, but, and I normally function pretty well. But let's say I'm a student and I'm walking down the hallway and I'm trying to get to class, right? And then I get triggered by a trauma reminder, something that reminds me of the things that are happening to me outside, a loud noise, a hard look from somebody, right? And suddenly my internal needle goes, and it lands in my fear groove. And then my, my body suddenly becomes ready to fight or flee. So my muscles are tense. I've got behavioral impact, propulsivity, anxiety. I'm looking for threat-related cues. And that's all really good and fine if I'm actually under threat. It's terrible to have on board if I'm trying to learn algebra. Right? And so this is a little bit about what's happening here. Um, super simplistic uh, uh, picture of the brain. Um, but basically what we found is that, so the learning thinking brain is just behind your forehead, prefrontal cortex, um, in charge of rational thinking, survival emotional brain further down, the limbic system, amygdala, right, in charge of survival and, um, and sort of emotion. And what, what folks, what researchers found when they put combat vets in a brain scan machine and then triggered them with a trauma reminder is that the frontal lobe, the, the learning, their learning thinking brain largely went offline. Um, and the survival brain took over. So whether that looks like fight or whether that looks like freeze, right, the, the, the learning thinking brain is not on when triggered, even when folks are not actually under threat because they're more easily knocked into that groove, right? And so the metaphor that we've been using with our work is that of a rider and a horse, okay? So think of the rider as sitting high up on the horse and, the, um, and can uh, prioritize, plan, think rationally. You know, oh, that's interesting over there, but I know I gotta get over here, so I'm gonna turn my attention this way, right? That's how the horse, the part of our learning thinking brain um, works. And further down is the survival emotional brain. That's the horse, very strong, very fast, X on protect protective instincts. And when you've got a rider and a horse working in an integrated way together, right? The, the, those parts of the brain integrated, you can get pretty far, do a lot of work, right? But what happens when triggered is that the rider falls off the horse. And when that happens with a student and say, you've got a student, riders off their horse, 
not to throw a chair. In that moment, the, the sort of traditional teaching bag of tricks, rewards, consequences, um, lectures, you know, making sure they write down what, how they should do better on a reflection sheet, those things are not going to work in that moment. Why? Because you're talking to the part of the brain that is a terrified nonverbal creature bent on survival. In fact, those things can make it worse, right? Escalate kids. Um, and this not only happens to students, but it can happen to adults too. Right? And when we, as adults in a school, at, react towards students with our riders off of our horses, what can happen, it's, and sometimes that happens because people are burnt out or secondarily traumatized themselves, what can happen is we might actually be the ones triggering students into survival mode and then punishing them for being there. Right? So we need to do everything we can to recognize triggered behavior as a fear response and respond accordingly by helping the person who's triggered feel more safe, a little bit more in control, get their rider back on their horse, and noticing when our own riders are starting to fall off our own horses, get, and then do everything we can to get that rider back on, or tap out and ask for help so that we do not inadvertently cause harm. So that's true for teachers, it's true for principals, it's true for leaders, it's true for anyone who works with people. Right? So I've been talking about individual neurobiology, but our, our organizations are actually made up of living beings, you and I. So they actually work uh, a lot like living organisms, right? Um, and um, what we know is that when you, so this is, you can't, don't need to know what's on this org chart, but it's very organized here, right? What we know is that trauma-impacted, under-resourced organizations, there's a, dis, there's a gravitational pull towards disorganization. Right? Because trauma fragments. And what you might see in this sort of organization is a lack of cohesion um, and connection between teams, splitting, finger pointing, scapegoating, his fault, her fault, her fault, overreactivity or shutdown and numbness. Sometimes even an overfocus on threat reduction, a lot of fear based decision making, where suddenly it's all about the rules and policy and order, and we get really rigid about this. And the problem with this way of thinking is that it's actually at the expense of relationship of innovation, of growth, of being able to think outside the box, which you better start doing if we want to try to get past the crazy stuff that's happening these days, right? So um, if this feels familiar to you about an organization you work with or your own, instead of asking the question, what is wrong with these people? Can we ask the question, what has happened to us? Right? Is it possible that actually we're impacted by stress and trauma um, and we're just trying to soldier on because there's so much work to do, but it's affecting us, right? And when we don't attend to those effects, what happens is we can actually harm the very people we are trying to serve as well as each other. So it's actually incumbent upon us to address trauma on an organizational level. If you think about a delivery system, right, like a syringe, if the syringe is a little bit broken, it doesn't matter how good our treatments are that are inside it, right, that, that, that treatment is not going to get to the people that we're trying to serve. Could even hurt them. So. So I've just talked about a trauma-reactive organization, which can be trauma-inducing. We're trying to move away from being trauma-inducing to being more trauma-informed. And what that means is realizing the widespread impact of trauma, recognizing how it shows up at work, responding by shifting our practices, and doing everything we can to resist re-traumatizing people, right? Um, but that's not even the end point. The end point, really, is safe and supportive and healing organizations, which are, instead of being fragmented, um, are integrated, where we take time to reflect with each other about the meaning of our work or learn from our mistakes, where it's relationship-centered. It's people who deliver the services, and it's people who are at the center of the services, not uh, test scores or beds. Um, it's, it's collaborative. It's growth-oriented wellness focused and it's equitable. Not just equitable um, at the sort of on the ground level, but all the way up through leadership, yeah, inclusive. And these organizations are healing and trauma reducing. We wanna move from trauma inducing to trauma reducing. So if we were gonna take some practices and policies and sort of run them through this part of the lens, we might ask this question. Is what we're doing trauma inducing or trauma reducing? Does it take into account how trauma and chronic stress can adversely affect individuals, but also relationships and the whole organization? And does it proactively work to ameliorate those effects? Okay. 
So I'm going to move on to our next uh, principle. These first two principles are our foundational principles, so I'm going to spend more time on those and then touch on the last four. Cultural humility and responsiveness. So for those of you who aren't familiar with this term, sorry, this, this was all centered before, I just want you to know. Um, uh, the cultural humility is the V2 of cultural competence, right? It's, it's reflecting together as a community about some of the root causes of suffering, racism, sexism, homophobia, um, xenophobia, that sort of fear of strangers that is so much in happening these days, the fear of immigrants. Um, and knowing that those things are baked into our institutions and the way we deal with each other. And so then taking accountability both individually and institutionally to no longer perpetuate those harms, right? Cultural humility is at the center of what we do. So when I went to um, therapy school a really long time ago, these are the kinds of traumas that we learned about. All very traumatic, most of them that cut across uh, all cultural uh, backgrounds, right? But these traumas happen in the context. And this is our, the context of, of our country, um, right? So these sorts of societal oppressions, racism, sexism, classism, and, and so on, um, can actually be experienced as a trauma in and of themselves. It's that looming and sometimes quite concrete in your face threat, right? That somehow, say, my uh, safety and well being is not as important as somebody else's safety and well-being because of the lottery of birth, right? The color of my skin, who I love, where I was born, how I talk, yeah? And so, and that brings up the same neurobiology as other sorts of threats. Um, and these kinds of, um, of, of uh, traumas, uh, Kenneth Hardy calls sociocultural trauma. Sociocultural trauma is historical. Um, our country was built on a legacy of genocide, of enslavement of people, and segregation enforced by terror. And because of that history, those things are, um, the, things like racism, for, for example, are built into our institutions and our policies. And these things happen on an individual, interpersonal level. Um, for example, research tells us that our unconscious implicit biases, which research tells us we all have, um, make us more likely to react negatively to students of color. And for example, um, we, uh, we tend to see and treat African-American young boys as though they were much older than they actually are. Um, and so we end up seeing even young children who misbehave as threats as opposed to children in need of support and guidance, right? So this becomes part of how we need to do this work well. Because the sort of middle circle traumas and the context, those sorts of traumas, can cause a synergistic effect on people. And we need to stop doing that. Um, so one big example of this, right, is that these societal forces coupled with other forms of unaddressed trauma synergistically feed what we now refer to as the school to prison pipeline, the school to prison pipeline, where our um, our young people who are uh, uh, people of color, children of color, are, uh, are disproportionately um, dropping out or really being pushed out of school by disproportionate use of things like suspension and expulsion. And then they are at much higher risk for landing in prison and that feeds the, the phenomenon of mass incarceration of people in, of color that we have in our country. That's just like one really big example of how this works. And we, it's our job to try to interrupt that. Um, so that is why uh, gender justice Racial justice, LGBT, LGBT, and immigrant justice is central to being trauma-informed. So for example, we believe that if a policy is not racially just, it's not trauma-informed. So when we're looking at our, our, our practices and policies through a trauma-informed lens, does this induce sociocultural trauma or reduce it? Does it perpetuate the effects of implicit bias and historical institutionalized structural oppression? Or does it actively work to counteract these effects and promote equity? I want to say, because there's this tide, we actually have to actively you know, counteract it. Because if we just stay in one place, we'll get carried away by it. Make sense? All right. So last uh, four principles that we're just going to touch on, and then I'm going to talk about the, um, our program for a second. So the next one is safety and predictability. 
And um, what we know from the brain science is that none of us can upshift into thinking and learning brain if we don't feel safe, right? None of us. So it becomes absolutely um, uh, crucial to establish safety. And I do mean physical safety, which is what most people think. But also, we mean relational safety, you know, the trust that other people have our backs. Probably one of the most important forms of safety that we have the most control over. Emotional safety, where we all sort of bolster our stress management skills. And predictability, this is stability. This is um, the fact that, so this comes from the idea that like, that, that feeling of like, what's gonna happen next is really triggering for trauma impacted people. And actually most of us don't like that feeling, right? We do better with routines. So how do we make our systems predictable, consistent? Um, we prepare, for example, our, our students for transitions that are about to happen, right? So that we can make transitions as trauma free as possible. Um, and how do we reduce unnecessary triggers? Whether those are environmental triggers, that door that always slams, or maybe even my sort of my voice, my facial expressions, um, you know, the ways that I may be triggering people. Okay, um, just touching on the next principle, this is compassion and dependability. What we know is that our worst traumas tend to happen in relationship, right? Someone has hurt us, abandoned us, rejected us. And we're also hardwired to heal within caring and trustworthy relationships. So research demonstrates that strong, positive relationships are central to academic achievement as well as to healing. So we need to foster compassion and dependable relationships, not just teacher-student relationships, but also among staff and, you know, say between the principal and the, and the, uh, the teachers and such, and with the caregivers and families that, um, of our students. So one of the many important concepts in this is this thing we call co-regulation, right? So human babies cannot regulate their own stress arousal systems. They're relying on us as adults to help them calm down when they're distressed. And we as adults are actually hardwired to respond to babies who stress, right? So if a baby's crying and I grab the baby and I hold, hold the baby, then I'm hardwired to sort of use my voice, it's okay baby, and my rhythm and my touch to calm the baby down. And remember neurons that fire together, wire together. This is with co-regulation over and over again. This is how in the best of circumstances, babies um, wire up to be able to self-regulate, right? Um, now, the fact is we need co-regulation for our whole lives, our whole lives. There's some research that tells us when somebody's riders all the way off their horse, totally dysregulated, co-regulation is the fastest way to get them to calm as opposed to self-regulation. Um, and here's the pitch. We uh, say that when you're a teacher or anybody who works with um, children, principal, whatever have you, it is part of the job to provide co-regulation. Why? Because when we co-regulate, we help get our students thinking and learning and our colleagues thinking and learning brain on so they can work with us. Does it make sense? And if you are providing co-regulation to trauma-impacted people day in and day out, you really need co-regulators yourself. So think about who are your co-regulators at work? Who are they at home? How do we make sure that we do everything we can to stay self-regulated so that we can provide co-regulation? Maybe that's by getting co-regulation co from other people. All right. Um, so, touching on the last two, uh, empowerment and collaboration. So, why this is a principle is that trauma, almost by definition, renders us feeling helpless. So, every time we take away someone's voice and choice and make them feel disempowered, we're potentially re-traumatizing them. Um, and research tells us that during a potentially traumatic event, being able to take action and do something to protect oneself actually makes a difference on whether or not this terrifying event is going to cause lasting harm or not, right? And the other piece is research tells us that even a perception of control over our stressor, just a perception of control over our stressor can mitigate the effects of toxic stress that we may feel when we feel things are out of our control, right? So in the end, um, be best practices and treatment interventions for complex trauma indicate that building a sense of agency, of voice and choice, um, the, get, build, building a sense that we can do something about our plight, that we can work together to do something to make positive changes for ourselves and each other is a crucial component to recovering and healing from trauma trauma reducing as opposed to trauma inducing. So as leaders and policymakers, for example, we make better decisions when we involve the people who are going to be affected by those decisions in the decision, right? Bring their voice to the fore. And then this approach also allows leaders to be able to help heal our trauma impacted organizations when we bring those voices to the fore. Um, and the field of restorative practices tells us that people develop um, and make lasting change when those in authority do things with them and not to them or for them. We want to do with, not to. Last one, resilience and um, social-emotional learning. 
So resilience can be described as being able to face down the often brutal reality of what is, but also knowing that we can overcome it. So this principle is not only about, ask, not only about asking what has happened to you, but what has gotten you through, right? And being able to honor what people have brought to bear to get through their adversities and build on those strengths. Part of our work in schools is instilling hope, and we want to help communities understand that people who have experienced trauma can heal with the support of caring others and, and can come out on the other side even wiser, stronger, more compassionate, maybe even uniquely qualified to give back to the world in a certain kind of way. So um, we want to pay attention to resilience. Um, in schools, one of the ways to build resilience for students is to do these social-emotional learning curricula um, and teach these kinds of skills because they're very highly uh, 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 co correlated with resilience, and schools are in a unique position to do that. And then for us as adults, I just want to offer to you the Greater Good Science Center has their whole mission in life is science-based wellness practices that can help us um, stay well. Things like kindness, compassion, mindfulness, and when we attend to our our own resilience, we can do this work well while staying healthy in the process. Yes? Very important. So in terms of policy, and I uh, have just a couple minutes here, but I'm running out of time. But here we are. Practice and policy through a trauma-informed lens. So safety and predictability. Does it establish physical and relational and emotional safety? Does it create stability? Does it foster compassion and dependable relationships? Does it facilitate collaboration, doing things with people, not to them or for them? And does it proactively promote resilience and wellness? Right. So in my closing minute, um, I'm just going to tell you a little bit about our program as one example of how we can address trauma in schools. So we take a public health approach to addressing trauma in schools, which is congruent with what schools call multi-tiered system of supports. So um, in our full school-based, uh, uh, site-based program, we do tier one supports. These are universal supports where, where we are providing trauma training to everybody in the school, teachers, um, classified staff, et cetera. And we're using this lens to augment school-wide supports like positive behavior interventions and supports, PBIS, restorative practices, um, uh, equity practices. We also provide tier, sorry, this is not easy to look at, tier two supports um, where we are trying to work with the school's teams on helping at-risk students. We're providing wellness groups to teachers. We're helping them look at their discipline policies to make sure the discipline policies are restorative and trauma-informed. And finally, tier three or um, psychotherapy um, uh, on-site psychotherapy, we're working not only with the students, but with their adults, their caregivers, and their teachers, right? And so there's some promising results here. Um, the folks that we work with on, on school sites um, in, uh, report an increase in knowledge about trauma-informed practices and the use of trauma-informed practices um, in students' ability to learn and um, in their, their students' time spent in classrooms. We're also seeing, um, where when we get to be there for, for multiple years, a decrease in disciplinary office referrals, decrease in aggression, um, and a decrease in suspensions. So really big changes. Um, uh, we've reached all, all of the uh, students in student um, SFUSD because they've made HEARTS training a mandatory training for people who work at the schools. Um, they just passed a, actually a few years ago now, passed a safe and supportive schools policy where trauma-sensitive practices are written through whole, the whole policy. So it's, it's, a, it's a requirement now. We get to work with lots of folks, and I already talked to you about how we've spread. I'm going to close with this quote. Uh, this is a quote from one of our principals uh, at, at our Hearts School. UCSF Hearts has shifted the way we discipline students at school. We're a lot more empathetic. We take time to allow kids to cool off, to have those meltdowns, and then come back without being suspended or sent home. So getting at that cradle-to-prison pipeline that you're talking about, we're not reproducing the same model of, oh, you're out of here, ostracizing kids and sending them out for things that they may feel are out of their control. So if you can see that the, the, if the principal feels this way, he can support his staff to feel that way, and we can better support kids. Now, I really believe this is about changing the world. Um, I know I really feel like taking a trauma-informed and healing approach to things can help change some of the suffering and help some of the suffering in the world. It's an honor to be with you in this work. I want to thank you for what you do each and every day to make this world a better place. And I'll uh, take questions. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Um, would you mind sitting down and all sure.
Um, so can I ask folks that have questions to please approach the microphone? We have a couple of minutes for a few questions and would certainly love to entertain questions that are coming from all of you out there in the audience. But um, to get started, um, I guess I'll ask what you think policymakers might be able to do to help advance this work. I know we'll talk about that later in the final session, but your thoughts on that would be great. Should I stay down here? <laughs> so I think that, again, if policymakers can think about how policies can forward each of these principles, that would be really helpful. I also think it's important for policymakers to make sure to, to not just mandate that our treatments are culturally relevant and have some evidence behind them, but also make sure that we are caring for the workforce that is caring for our, our patients and clients. Because if we don't do that, what we're doing is we're, we're harming the delivery system. Thank you. Um, Don? Dr. Dorado, is this on? Okay. I think it is. <laughs> uh, so I, I'm left wanting more. Uh, yes. You know, I want another hour on, on how the program <laughs> actually works and things like that. Yes, but of course. A, a question that's related to that, I think, is how do you bridge that academic UCSF understanding and get it into a school system as effectively as you have. Yeah, so we worked really closely with the school district on even developing the program, um, helping them understand, you know, that we understood together what the outcomes were they were looking for. And we want to, we want to integrate and dovetail with what's already there, so PBIS and restorative practices. What we try to say to folks is that this trauma-informed thing is not something else for the plate. It actually helps to strengthen the plate so that things like PBIS and restorative practices and SEL curricula can work for all kids and not just the kids they always work for. So we also have really gotten buy-in by making sure it's clear to teachers that we are, we are really concerned about their wellness and taking care of them. So we, we work in the community. We don't just sit in our offices waiting for people to come to us. Thank you. So this will be our last question because we're a little over time, but um, your question, please. Good morning, Rob. Good morning. with the uh, County Behavioral Health Directors Association. Hi. I think San Francisco in California is a beacon of light when you come to talk about things like trauma and for care and mm -hmm. working with the school district, but mm -hmm. gosh, there are other counties that are really struggling to operationalize these kinds of things. So could you sure. share some advice about putting together the partnership between you, you know, and the, and the school districts and yeah. sort of how you could operationalize that in places like MODOC or uh, INYO or things yeah. like that? Yeah. So um, lots to say there. I can point you towards a couple of, um, of resources. Trauma, there's, a organ, there's a website called traumasensitive.org where they actually have a whole roadmap on how you can start from square zero and try to create more trauma-informed schools. I think, again, the key, pe the key pieces are partnership with the communities and bringing in the voice of educators, caregivers, students to think about, well, what, what's happening to us, right? And then what might be the good first, you wanna pick the first, low-hanging fruit thing that you can do to help people feel just a little bit better and then slowly get by and that way you start very small and then spread. Thank you. So please help me thank Dr. Dorado for her presentation. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you.